Welcome to Let's Talk Humanitarian, Parlons Humanitaire, enriching conversations with humanitarian workers and leaders to open eyes, heart, and mind. The program is um, developed by Kalu Institute, your online humanitarian aid studies center, where humanitarians train humanitarians. My name is Amelie Yanguifes, and I'm very honored to be your host for this conversation today with Dominique Gassawev. Welcome, Dominique. Thank you very Thank much you, for being here. Dominique, um, we, you currently work um, with OCHA New York in, in that scene uh, with this hat that we're going to listen to you and to listen to, to what you have to share with us about the uh, civil military Uh, coordination, which is uh, your area of um, your focus of work. And um, I wanted to share with our audience that actually I know Dominique for more than 10 years, I think. I was, we were blessed to work together in uh, Sri Lanka in a mm -hmm. tough context, but beautiful uh, experience, beautiful projects, beautiful programs. And um, I've been always, since the beginning, really moved and touched by. Um, your humanitarian spirit, your commitment to the people, the people in need. So that's really, I'm, I'm really excited to have you here on this program because you, you, you have a lot to give and to, to, to share to us in terms of um, humanitarian aid and in terms of uh, um, the, the development of humanitarian aid and its trends today. Because you started working in humanitarian aid over 15 years ago and it was in Darfur. Um, so, as I mentioned, you are the civil military focal point at OCHA New York right now. You've been working um, with OCHA since 2014 in Mali, in Chad, as Humanitarian Affairs Officer. Before joining OCHA, you've been working with a number of international organizations, also um, the European Union, ECHO, in emergency response, in headquarters, and in headquarters and uh, field-based positions across Africa and Asia. You hold a BA in politics with French, a master's in international relations and security studies, and a specialized master's in international public law. You're the mother of two gorgeous children, and you presently, you, you, you're speaking from Brussels, no? You're working out of, um, of Brussels due to the pandemic situation. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. Hi, Amelie, it's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm very excited to be just be speaking with you on this platform. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dominique. Um, could you tell us a little, so what is your work about? What is the civil military focal point um, job about? Yeah, so as many of you might know or not, uh, OCHA has a civil military coordination section, which is based in OCHA Geneva. OCHA has two headquarters, actually, one based in New York and the other based in Geneva. And CMCS, which is the acronym, is based in Geneva. And what the team found was that there was a need to reinforce the linkages between within OCHA, between OCHA Geneva and OCHA New York. Um, on matters concerning civil military coordination and also to allow for partners outside of OCHA, uh, that's within the United Nations system, other entities in the Secretariat, for example, like the Department for Peace Operations, to have a go-to person in New York who could rapidly respond to technical questions and just mm -hmm. elaborate our collaboration together. So my job is really Uh, reinforcing the linkages within OCHA's different departments uh, on civil military coordination, building those synergies, and also outside with third partners um, that are also working on, on civil military coordination issues. Excellent. So that's my Thank job. Thank you so much. Wow, wow. Exciting. And, and, and we're going to, to, to dive into uh, to what exactly it, it, uh, it entails. And um, I, I remember... Uh, a number of years back, um, I remember hearing about CIMIC. So, so, and now it's, I understand the name is SIMCODE. So what has changed from CIMIC times to SIMCODE and what is the reason for, for this change of name? 
Exactly. So it's actually a, a question of, of attribution of acronyms. So CIMIC used to refer to what we do now and what we commonly know as UN SIMCORD now, which is the ongoing dialogue between humanitarian partners and military actors in field of operations. Um, and previously, indeed, this was what we referred to as CIMIC. But um, a few years ago, uh, some of the key military allies in NATO came up with the term CIMIC to define their operations um, that were dealing with civilian interaction. And so we didn't have we didn't feel it was appropriate to use the same language to to denote two very different types of activities because yeah. one is what we know as CIMIC today is is really military parlance for engagement between military entities and civilian entities be they the local population or other partners um, so we had to come up with a different term just to make sure that we had a clear distinction uh, to denominate what we were doing. So we came up with the term UN SIMCOR to really define the United Nations coordination capacity that OCHA provides in the field and at headquarters uh, to engage actively uh, with, uh, with military entities. And the reason why we engage with militaries is, is very simple. Uh, Conflicts are becoming increasingly complex, uh, they are of long duration, and we ob obviously often occupy the same space as military actors, be they national, uh, national armed forces, international armed forces, um, non-state armed groups. And in this category, we also include peacekeepers, UN peacekeepers or peacekeepers from other entities. Um, even though the role of all of these different military actors is obviously quite different, um, we do feel that as a humanitarian community, we need to have a dialogue with all relevant stakeholders to make sure that we are able to access populations in need. And, and having that dialogue with military actors is key in accessing, accessing these populations. Okay, excellent, and and uh, um, so interesting to know how because we 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 could think that um, the military and the humanitarian um, we 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 so much in 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 different areas, no? And and where is this meeting point that you see where where the dialogue happens actually? Mm, that's a very good question, and uh, and often in the trainings we provide, we we start off with uh, the different perceptions. You know, how do militaries? Uh -huh you humanitarians and how do humanitarians view militaries and in my own personal experience these preconceived notions are often the result of, of myths and stories that we hear uh, preconceived notions also from our own personal histories uh, that are often very wrong and it's always important to come back to the individual and who we're trying to speak with and what we're trying to discuss with these people and how dialogue is just indispensable for us as humanitarians because at the end of the day, that is our only weapon, right? To speak mm. to people, and, but not only to speak to people, but also to listen to our interlocutors and what their concerns are. So when we talk about military actors, for example, um, we do see a trend in international conflicts that, that show that military actors can have many different roles and many different objectives and, and many different ways of operating as well in different conflict environments. So what OCHA does in, in areas where the humanitarian community as a general uh, you know, community of membership sees the value, we establish dedicated coordination mechanisms. And these are adapted to the field needs. So they can be held at the capital level, but also in the deep field level where we have coordination hubs at the sub-regional level, for example. Uh -huh. And the idea around these discussions is to invite humanitarians uh, to discuss with military counterparts um, on how we operate on different uh, issues that we might face together or separately as a result of one another. One example could be that if we have uh, troops going out into the field, doing conducting their operations and they observe that certain areas are not benefiting from humanitarian assistance, it is important that they also feed back to to us so that we can understand why that might be the case and basically improve our uh, awareness of the situation and 
the situation of the affected populations that we are trying to reach. So information sharing is a key element of, of this dialogue. Mm -hmm. But the way that the dialogue is structured depends also on the context. And oftentimes when we're dealing with uh, natural disasters or non-international armed conflicts, for example, the level of engagement with militaries will differ because it's generally less politically sensitive to have close cooperation ties with military entities in a natural disaster setting um, because militaries have a logistical capacity that we are might that we might find useful in our humanitarian response and in a natural disaster setting usually the politics do not really come into play and militaries can more easily be perceived to be also neutral and impartial especially UN peacekeeping forces, for example, who are by definition neutral and impartial, but in conflict settings, the perception of these forces is not always as neutral or impartial mm. by the civilian population. So when we move into conflict settings, the engagement with military forces is more sensitive because the way in which these forces are being perceived. As humanitarians, as you well know, the humanitarian principles allow us to operate even in the most complicated areas because we are perceived as neutral, impartial, operational, in, operationally independent. If we are seen as being too closely aligned with one party to the conflicts or one uh, military entity that might be perceived as a party to the conflict, that might compromise our ability to access populations in need in the short, medium or long term. Wow, so interesting. Thank you so much, Dominique. And, and would you say when we able to, um, to have this dialogue, I mean, we, we, we're having it and, and um, um, with the, between the humanitarian and, and military actors, what is the difference that we make in the lives of people? I mean, in the lives of the vulnerable people, the, the people why, why we are on the ground. Uh, what um what is the difference we we can make in their lives with through this dialogue? Well, the impact uh, is 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 first of all that we can we can have an opportunity to communicate and help other actors who are working in the same environment as us understand who we are as a community, as a humanitarian aid community, what we do, what our objectives are, and how we do that. Because the how in humanitarian assistance is really what distinguishes us from other actors, even development actors. The fact that we are operationally independent, that we are pursuing uh, you know, humanitarian assistance to deliver that in an impartial manner based on needs, these are very, um, these are very delicate nuances that other actors in the field need to understand so that we can maintain our perception as being independent and neutral partners. Um, the impact that we have is basically in, in terms of access and humanitarian access. When we have, for example, a convoy of humanitarian assistance leading from A to B, uh, in some countries, OCHA manages, for example, humanitarian notification systems. So this is a way in which we can notify the parties to the conflict that this convoy will be moving from A to B at a given time and to make sure and recall the obligations of parties to the conflict of their obligations under international humanitarian law, which is to, that these are protected entities, be they uh, you know, moving convoys or stable sites. Unfortunately, of course, we see plenty of evidence around the world that uh, it is not a perfect system. The protections under international humanitarian law that we are trying to reinforce with these tools are not always uh, effective 100%, but they do help us create that dialogue and constantly reinforce the need of protected spaces and protecting civilians and aid workers in very, very hostile environments. So it is a key element um, to make sure that these, these principles and these concepts and the legal obligations are constantly being um, informed because it's never one can never take that for granted and we do see that uh, while many militaries do invest in that and that is a positive trend that we are seeing uh, the awareness that soldiers and officers bring in terms of international humanitarian law is is in many cases impressive uh, and people 
in those capacities and roles are very, very, very well aware of those responsibilities and, and take them very seriously. And they are also very eager to engage with us on, you know, how they can improve that. So we also, as OCHA, conduct a lot of capacity building uh, for military entities. We are part of training courses regularly for many types of armed forces at headquarter level or in the field. Um, and also, of course, with the, with the UN Department for Peace Operations, which manages the peacekeeping uh, entities. Just uh, yesterday, actually, we were giving a uh, course on uh, humanitarian assistance in the context of peacekeeping operations to future force commanders and deputy force commanders, which are the leadership in uh, missions. So this is a way that we can constantly keep that message going and, and encourage a discussion. And, and the importance is not just speaking about these things, but also listening and understanding what problems they might be facing. Um, when 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 they're dealing with humanitarians, yeah. because there are still some humanitarian operators who feel very reticent about engaging too closely with the military, or they feel uncomfortable because they might lack the experience, they might have previous experience that might have not been so positive. So OCHA really serves a role there to help support that dialogue as a neutral interface. Um, so often fire times in the field, for example, if we're working in a context where perceptions are highly sensitive, we will organize uh, dedicated meetings in OCHA offices where both parties, military or, um, or civilian, can meet in a safe space uh, and where there is, no, uh, there is no fear for these organizations to be perceived as having direct uh, contact. Because if they were going to invite militaries to their offices, and people are watching that might be perceived as as something a little uh, uncomfortable depending on who is watching right so archa offers that space safe space of dialogue where we can where we can exchange where we can um, basically build these relations mm. thank you so much dominique and, and it's um it's really interesting and and uh, moving because when uh, you know this word coordination uh, it has lost a, a lot of its prestige because we, we use it so much for so many years and we identify coordination with uh, meetings that, that, that are useless and where people have coffee and tea and discuss uh, with, with, with no clear objective. And when I'm hearing about this civil military coordination, I hear it like a, it's actually a life-saving tool because it enables the humanitarian actors to access people people to access um, the, the aid and to accept the aid also uh, without putting their lives at risk, being identified by other parties like, oh no, you, you're going, you know, it's, it's, it's so essential. So thank you for bringing mm -hmm. this light uh, to this topic. Um, would you, do you have in mind like a success story of, um, of civil military coordination uh, uh, that, that you have seen in the field, um, a, a concrete example of some country? that you would like to share with us? Uh, well, it's always sensitive to, to single out one yeah. country. So yes. I, I'd rather uh, take away the country. Or, yes, exactly. phenomenal. Yes, um, thank you. Mm. Well, I think, I think one, one example that really comes to mind was, uh, was in, a recent, uh, in a recent mission of mine where we, uh, we were looking at the coordination structure. And just to emphasize and, and go back to your point on coordination, I mean, as a humanitarian practitioner, and Otto will often be the, the, the organizer of many such coordination meetings, um, it's, it, is, it is a difficult challenge because we have so many reporting obligations and you know, humanitarian aid in itself is becoming increasingly complex, also by the sheer number of actors on the humanitarian side that claim to be humanitarian actors. So there are just a lot more people to coordinate, a lot more types of organizations to coordinate that are not necessarily interpreting the humanitarian principles in the same way. And this is one of the big differences between military operations and humanitarian operations. A military structure by country or even in the UN peacekeeping operation is a very unified hierarchical entity. So the, order, the officers, the, the, the rank and hierarchy are clearly defined, the roles and responsibilities, the mandate. So it's, it's, it's very clear on who you need to talk to to get what decision made. On the humanitarian side, we're a very 
you know, it's a very motley crew of different types of organizations with varying levels of of of, uh, of capacity, of funding, uh, and also the decision making levels are very different. So. Actually, I re we realized in this one country where I was operating that there was a misunderstanding and uh, an expectation gap in the decision-making capacity of humanitarian organizations. The militaries had a very clear delineated structure of command and uh, that was also decentralized at the field level. So there were relatively senior positions in field-based locations who were able to take certain decisions. And they were speaking at the tactical operational level with the coordination hubs in the field. On the humanitarian side, apart from a few UN agencies, the, the humanitarian NGOs did not have the same level of seniority and decision-making capacity in the field. That was really happening at the capital level in a very supportive way. And this is by all means not a criticism, it's just a reality in the organizational setup, right? So what we realized was that the people in the field on the military side were expecting a level of, of reactivity and decision making that was not compatible with the reality of how the NGO decision making structure was made. So how we tried to address this was by introducing another layer of coordination at the capital level where the senior most levels of command on the military side and the humanitarian side could meet and discuss strategic questions uh, that were being fed up the system respectively from the field. And we organized these meetings on a quarterly basis. It was extremely successful and it helped us make sure that we had the buy-in from the top level command and uh, senior humanitarian leadership on strategic questions and even adopting coordination tools like the humanitarian notification system that I mentioned earlier was important to understand first where was the problem and where was this expectation gap because the military side was sometimes frustrated saying yes but we wanted to get this done quickly and then the humanitarians take such a long time to get these decisions in approved and it was just because it was not clear that the decision making level was not the same on the humanitarian and on the civilian uh, on the civilian side and on the military side okay, so that is one uh, example <laughs> N nice, very, very interesting to see all these challenges no? that that uh, we we facing at different levels. And uh, what what if we want to deepen um, this question of uh, civil military? What are the resources that uh, you would recommend we we read or we watch? Well, we have as uh, the UN uh, as OCHA's civil military coordination service. We have a, an excellent website that's regularly updated with key documents and resources uh, that are produced both by OCHA but also partners who are working on this. And we also have some country examples um, of of positive uh, tools that have been used and tested. Uh, we, for example, we very much. Uh, uh, advocate for the adoption of country-specific SIM cord guidelines or guidance in the fields where, again, humanitarian partners and military partners think this could help improve relations and the dialogue. And these country-specific guidelines are basically a framework that recalls what different roles uh, are attributed to humanitarians, to the military functions, what are the areas where we can work together, and what are the underlying principles that uh, basically define our collaboration or cooperation. Um, so one example is, for example, the fact that, you know, any use of military or civil defense assets would only be used in a situation of last resort. Uh, the same goes for the use of armed escorts. They are absolutely only to be used when all other options have been exhausted. And these kinds of principles are just important to to set down, uh, because especially in UN peacekeeping operations, what we're seeing in, in a number of mandates of the missions that are in the field now, starting with MINUSMA, but also MINUSCA in the Central African Republic, is that part of the mandate also has an element uh, linking the mission to humanitarian assistance. For MINUSMA, for example, um, one paragraph of the mandate actually specifies that MINUSMA has a mandate to 
help create a secure environment for the delivery of humanitarian assistance. What does that mean? How do we interpret that without compromising the humanitarian principles yeah. and humanitarian actors being perceived as neutral and impartial? So basically, as a complement to that, we have the country-specific guidelines that are being developed at the moment, and where we will also recall that, you know, while the use of armed escorts would help secure humanitarian assistance, yeah. that needs to that can only happen under very, very specific circumstances when it is requested by the humanitarian community and it cannot be imposed by any other actor. Well, it's really interesting to 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 hear that now the trend is having this specific the country specific guidelines because mm -hmm. then it obliges no stakeholders in the parties to to sit together, discuss it and contextualize it. No? Fantastic. Exactly. So I exactly. guess OCHA provides a, a, a template. We have a template and all of that information is available in the recently published, uh, well, it's not that recent, it came out in 2018, the new SINCORD uh, handbook that was done by OCHA. It's also available in French, which is great news. Um, to, and we're trying to uh, make sure that our, our documents are available in as many languages as, as possible. Uh, and the handbook really helps, is a very operationally oriented document that has lots of hyperlinks to good examples, good practices, and, and it's a very useful tool for anybody who's interested in it. And there you can also find some examples of country-specific guidelines. We have them in Haiti, for example, mm -hmm. in South Sudan, in the DRC, and, uh, and they're really, as you say, alone the process in reaching those agreements and defining those guidelines is yeah. already a very, very good positively reinforcing experience because it brings together the different actors and it, it, it forces us all to hash out the differences, the nuances, and to make sure that we have a document that everybody can, uh, can you know, find themselves in. And also making sure that the dissemination happens because oftentimes with these kinds of documents, you have a core team of drafters that are pushing it, then it gets adopted after a while, and then it sort of falls into oblivion. So the importance yeah. is also making sure that the dissemination and communication strategy that follows the adoption is equally uh, invested in to make sure that all of the necessary stakeholders have that knowledge. Because Within the humanitarian community, you know very well that we have a high level of turnover for staff. Yeah. So making sure that the institutional memory is preserved um, is extremely, extremely important. Thank you so much, Dominique. We could stay hours talking about that. So fascinating. <laughs> and, and I love hearing how we're progressing now. We, we're progressing and, and, and starting really to make a, uh, an important difference. So, so that's really encouraging. Thank you for sharing all that. And, and just as uh, now we're going to finalize soon our, our conversation, I have uh, two questions. Uh, well, two sets of questions, I would say. First set, just one question uh, to, to, to close the, the civil military um, uh, discussion, coordination discussion. Um, what would you say are the big perspectives now for the, 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 the areas you, you're really focusing on for, for the next years? So I understand there's these guidelines. Is there anything else that um, you're focusing on in terms of civil military coordination? Uh, well, one of the trends that we're seeing in general is, uh, and this has been going on for the last few years, is the expansion of member states' uh, foreign policy toolbox, uh, as they call it, to also include humanitarian aid in that. And I'm sure you'll remember the discussions we had within the European Commission, to what extent does humanitarian aid figure in this bigger toolbox. And now this conversation has moved from what we used to call LRRD, linking relief, rehabilitation and development. And now we have this other term called nexus between the humanitarian development and peace actors, the HDP nexus. And this is a trend that we're really observing very closely, also from a civil military coordination perspective, because uh, increasingly uh, lines between aid in general and military interventions, especially by Western countries, is becoming increasingly blurred. And oftentimes, where there is a military intervention, there will also often be a, a funding, a pooled fund or a trust fund of some sort that helps fund assistant projects in the areas of interventions. We used to see that in Afghanistan and Iraq with the PRTs, the 
provincial rehabilitation teams that used to take place there where they would engage, military forces would engage in reconstruction efforts, building schools and hospitals. And where we're still seeing this trend uh, continue. And one of the elements that really comes back a lot with SimCord is the need to really distinguish humanitarian assistance from all of these types of activities and try to encourage member states to, to focus on uh, more secondary or tertiary type assistance, uh, be that infrastructure or just logistical assistance where it is necessary and where humanitarian assistance cannot reach certain affected areas. So I would say the first point is really, again, it's not new, but it's it's just repeating and, and trying to manage this trend of, of, a, of a, a fusion of the aid and, and defense objectives and security objectives. Uh, to give an example, for example, Barkhane has a development fund in its operational profile um, for certain parts of, of the areas that are in the theater of operations. And the funding of projects, um, while of course it is the prerogative of, of France to be able to do that, by having reinforced coordination, we can try to influence that process so that we can help you know, promote the humanitarian principles and ensure as much distinction as possible um, through that way. Another trend uh, that we're, of course, watching very closely is uh, is the, the relations between humanitarian actors and non-state armed groups, which we also, for us, they fall under the, under the umbrella of armed actors. And non-state armed groups, uh, regardless of what their ideological or political imperatives are, they are still considered to be potential stakeholders and dialogue, um, partners of dialogue for us to access populations in need. And what we're observing very closely is to see where are the countries where we do have relatively good levels of engagement with such groups and where do we, where is that a bit more problematic and trying to explain the reasons for the areas where it is more difficult. And oftentimes it is a matter of perception that perhaps mm -hmm. Humanitarian actors are not entirely perceived to be entirely neutral and impartial. And then we as uh, SimCord, we try to discuss with partners, how can we engage in better understanding these dynamics and support partners in addressing those so that we can really access the populations in need. Thank you so much, Dominique, for, for, for these insights. And um, now I'll... I would like to, to close civil military coordination chapter because it's, it's, I mean, so much you've given us. We're going to go to the web page and, and, uh, and look for some more information. Um, thank you for, for, for giving us all, all of this. And, and um, to, to close our conversation and to say goodbye to you, I would like to ask two questions more about Dominic uh, mm. as a humanitarian worker. Um, have you ever dreamt of doing something else than humanitarian aid? Well, two, two things come to mind immediately. Um, I actually come from a, a very long standing history of hoteliers. So uh, my family had uh, hotels and taverns until the middle age back in Austria. And I always had this little sort of side dream that if anything, I, I might possibly go back to that and open a little hotel of my own. I very much like welcoming people um, and, and hosting people and hearing from people and their experiences from all different horizons. And one little dream that I would have is to have a sort of uh, guest house retreat where humanitarian workers, but also military folks or, or other people who might need a break from life for a while or come back <laughs> from a difficult mission have just some time to, to collect themselves and, uh, and recharge their batteries. So that is one of the, the dreams. The other one would be to, to pursue more a, a career in law and, uh, and to, to practice law as, as a lawyer. Those would be the two wow. other, other slides. Yes. Yeah, good. Excellent. I, I, I love the idea of this guest house. I, I had goosebumps. Yes. Oh my God, but <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, I booked my room already. I booked my room. Very good. Yeah. You'll have a standing room. There'll be the Amelie suite. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I love that. And a question like to, to, to inspire that many of, um, uh, of our audience, um, they are humanitarian workers or are studying uh, to become a humanitarian workers or to, to, to upgrade the, the experience of humanitarian work. 
you 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 have more than 15 years uh, of of experience in that field knowing all what you know now would you be today to start your career your humanitarian career but with all what you know is there anything different that you would do um at one point uh i i for personal reasons i had to start uh looking at having a bit more of a stable life um and moving around from emergency missions deep field based uh, was becoming incompatible with uh, with the personal life and this is a struggle that i think many of us face mm -hmm. uh, between the the professional aspirations and passions that we have and then also the desire to, to have a family at some point so that that is a tension that I have been trying to resolve uh, for the last 15 years, and it's still it's still difficult. It doesn't get easier because you get an increasing number of opportunities, uh, the more experience you gather. And I think if I could do something a bit differently, it would be to to stay a bit more longer in the in the deep field environment uh, mm. because that is really what today. Uh, drives me uh, in my motivation in everything that I do. I hear the voices from uh, the people that I've met, be they colleagues, be they um, beneficiaries, uh, be they you know the, the the local chiefs that we used to spend hours drinking tea with, negotiating, explaining, understanding, but also hearing obviously what they had been going through, what their challenges are in, in managing their communities in difficult times. And that is really what um, what feeds my my motivation to this day. And uh, and I wish uh, I could have spent a little bit more time in those environments. But I'm thinking once my children are a bit older, I'll be able to go back there and possibly uh, be more used because I was very very young when I was in those functions, and uh, and I had a lot to learn. Um, and uh, and that really that really carries me to until today. Thank you so much, Dominique, for all this knowledge that you shared, this inspiration and this practical experience that was truly an enriching conversation. Um, so that's the end of this Let's Talk Humanitarian, Parlons Humanitaire with Dominique Gassauer, Ocha, New York. Thank you. Thank you. It's lovely to be here.